So I made a video discussing the notion of idealism, which you can check out here. No, wait, here, if you haven't already seen it. Uh, but it's essentially the idea that the universe, rather than being composed of matter, is composed of mind. The ontological ground of existence is mental. The reason you can only ever experience mind is because there only ever is mind. This doesn't mean that the universe solely exists in our individual minds, but rather that the universe itself is akin to an experiencing being. Everything we perceive out there is the mind of a universal being. I laid out some of the arguments in favor of idealism and why it should be given consideration, but any theory we have about the ontological ground of existence should be able to cohere with reality and the observations we make about reality. And what I decided not to explain in my previous video is how quantum mechanics actually, if you think about it, supports this view. In this video, I intend to explain that. Now there's a couple of caveats which will inevitably accompany my explanation. Firstly, this by no means proves that the theory is correct because it relies on a certain interpretation of quantum mechanics and it could be possible that a different interpretation is correct. The interpretation that I assume to be true is known as the Copenhagen interpretation and more specifically the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation. I'll explain both of those soon if you're a bit puzzled, but the point is, is that I can't prove anything here with 100% certainty. All I can do is lay out the arguments and the observations and explain why idealism may be a better assumption than physicalism for a accounting for these observations. But I can't actually definitively conclude anything. This is the idea of parsimony. If two competing theories are both impossible to prove, we should consider how each of them coheres with reality, i.e. we assume that this thing is true and then we look at the universe and decide whether or not the universe we observe is consistent with this fundamental assumption. And this is what I intend to do for idealism. The second caveat is that I'm not a quantum physicist. I personally believe that I understand quantum mechanics fairly well, but I can't claim to be an expert. I've listened to a lot of experts and I've taken the time to digest the math which governs the way fundamental particles evolve over time, but there's always the risk that I've misunderstood something or have failed to account for something. But what I can assure you is that this is my honest, good faith attempt to demonstrate why idealism can better account for the facts of quantum mechanics than physicalism, potentially. Also important thing to know is that whenever there's talk of quantum mechanics and consciousness, it's easy to be dismissed by people thinking that I'm implying something spiritual or mystical, which I think is just a way to dismiss the idea before it's actually given ample consideration. And like I said, I'm just genuinely following the observations of quantum mechanics. The only assumption is idealism itself. And then you have to decide whether the assumption of idealism or the assumption of physicalism makes more sense. So quantum mechanics is a mathematical model created by our minds to explain observations perceived by our minds. And these equations attempt to give us information about a quantum object such as a particle. This allows us to predict the state of the particle at any time using these equations. A simple example from classical physics will help. Newton gave us this equation and it can be used to get information. Information is any property about a thing that can be known. You can know the weight of a thing, you can know its acceleration for example. So imagine that I had an object that weighed 5 kilograms and pushed it with a force of 10 newtons. I can use this information to learn the acceleration of the object using the equation. The idea of information is a very important concept. Anybody with basic knowledge in computer science can tell you that information can be stored as a series of ones and zeros on your hard drive. And you can even think of this as a series of yeses and nos. Your DNA also contains information and it contains all of the information necessary to um, build your body. Anything that can be known about a system and used to make predictions about how the system will evolve is information. If you know the exact genetic code of a fertilized egg, you can theoretically predict the exact body that that DNA will give rise to. Now we have also developed equations which tell us how particles evolve. And by particles, I mean what we believe to be the smallest units of matter. So like the building blocks of reality. And there's a sense in which there's nothing smaller than these particles, at least according to theory. The Schrodinger's equation also attempts to give us information about particles. But when you try to zoom in on the smallest possible thing, aka particles, it's almost like you're reaching this level where the universe doesn't want you to look anymore. We can still use the equation to find out where the particle is, for example. That would be an example of information we could gain about the particle. But the Schrodinger's equation tells us that the information we get is based on probability, which is not normally how we think about anything. Now keep in mind that this may seem abstract, but in reality, I'm talking about everything. Like everything you are seeing and observing around you is apparently composed of these particles. I say apparently because we often forget that nobody has actually ever seen a particle. You've only ever seen your own perceptions, and it's hard to say whether your perceptions are composed of particles. But particles are the things we assume to exist apart from our perceptions. I use this example a lot because I teach chemistry and I'm very familiar with it, and it's of electron orbitals, which look like a cloud around the nucleus. An electron, as you should all know, is a fundamental particle and they orbit the nucleus of atoms. 
But an electron orbiting a nucleus doesn't seem to be at a particular spot at any given time. Rather, its position is just somewhere in that cloud. The cloud represents probability. It shows us where the electron could be if we looked. But this brings up questions about the reality of the electron. Why does it exist in this abstract wave? Does it have properties before being measured? But if it does, how come its position is randomly plucked from the probability wave? Information about where the electron is only seems to emerge when we measure it. Before that, the electron seems to be in this state of blurry indeterminacy, where it has no concrete properties, only probabilities. So when we measure where the electron is and gain information about it, are we creating the information or just measuring it? This transition from probable properties, it could be here or it could be there, to definite properties, it is definitely here, is known as the collapse of the wave function. The wave function is essentially the equation we use that gives us a map of those probable properties. But then, when we take a measurement, it seems to collapse into a definite property. It's not that the electron is somewhere in the cloud, it's definitely here. You might be thinking to yourself, what actually counts as a measurement? I used to think that this was fairly straightforward, because to measure the position of an electron, we just need to bounce a particle of light, aka a photon, against it. That particle of light then goes into a particle detector and into our minds. What I believed, and I believed this for a long time without thinking about it critically, is that the properties of the electron, in this case where it is, gets created when the two particles interact. The particle of light gives the electron its properties, and in fact, the electron should do the same to the photon, because again, the photon is also a quantum object. It exists in a state of probability. So it's when they interact that the information is created. Interaction with other things collapses the wave function and gives the blurry quantum world definite properties. But I learned fairly recently that this isn't actually how it works. What happens instead is that the photon becomes entangled with the electron. Entanglement is a complicated phenomenon, and I can't explain all of the details related to entanglement. But boiled down to its simplest terms, it is the fact that the wave function can mix with other wave functions to produce a mixed wave function. So now we have to think of the electron and the photon as being part of this bigger wave function. So both are in a state of superposition. Nothing has been measured yet. All you've done is just made a more complicated wave function that still needs to be collapsed. Now, only when we detect the photon does the mixed wave function collapse. So the position of the photon and the electron becomes known and defined when the wave function of one of them collapses. The experiment that reveals this is quite profound, and it's crazy to think that we even found a way to test this, but it still raises questions about the wave function collapse, because what the hell is measurement? Because if everything is a particle, which is implied by physicalism, it implies that instead of becoming defined, the wave function is just growing to include every particle in the universe. So the electron's wave function gets mixed with the photon, and then the photon also gets mixed with the particles that make up the measuring apparatus. Because think about it, everything is made of particles. So if our measuring instrument is also made of particles, all you're doing when a photon comes near it is entangling that entire um, measuring apparatus, which again is composed of particles, with the wave function, with the system. So all you're doing is just creating this super complicated wave function that doesn't have any definite properties. So at what point does everything collapse into definite properties? This is known as the measurement problem, and there are a few ways to make sense of how the transition from quantum blurriness um, and indeterminacy to actuality and definite properties actually occurs. The Copenhagen interpretation argues that observation collapses the wave function. The act of seeing the photon after it reaches the particle itself influences where its position is. This is also suggested by the fact that we can choose to measure things in a specific way and get answers depending on the questions we ask. In the example that we chose, it would be like shooting a very high energy photon to get a more precise understanding of where the electron is. But again, it only becomes defined when we measure that photon. And even more trippy, the position of the photon also gets defined when we measure it because it's also a particle and exists in this superposition. It doesn't have a definite location until we measure it. But it still doesn't explain what measurement actually is, because if everything is made of particle, this mixed wave function should just mix with everything. The whole universe should just be in this state of quantum superposition with no actual defined properties. Now, Alfred Wigner and John von Neumann, two utter geniuses in the field of physics and mathematics, von Neumann in particular was like a next level genius, they formulated the idea that consciousness collapses the wave function. There is something different about consciousness which allows the world to have definite properties. Just think about this for a second. What is information without something to know that information? Information implies a thing that is holding or storing that information. Just like our brains store the information about the acceleration of the object. What even is physics or producing these equations without conscious observers that can give meaning to these equations? So consciousness makes existence meaningful and intelligible, 
but von Neumann and Wigner argue that it literally creates the universe. This explains why physics is really an attempt to understand the observations that we experience through our minds. Because we can only do physics about the things we perceive, so maybe our perceptions have something to do with the existence of the universe itself. Now, this is an important note for anybody who's been paying attention. I don't know for sure whether Wigner and von Neumann meant that consciousness as in conscious awareness or sentience as in any experience that occurs through mind and in which involves qualia. I think the latter, because the latter would imply that, for example, a cat, such as Schrodinger's cat, would be able to collapse the wave function. I think it makes sense to say that mind can collapse the wave function, but conscious awareness probably also does something to the wave function that's very important. Because again, conscious awareness is the only thing that can understand and interpret what the wave function actually is. Now, so far I haven't actually explained why you should believe that interpretation, but there are other interpretations of quantum mechanics which argue that this isn't the case and still attempt to preserve physicalism. And again, they could be right for all I know. There are a few of these, but I think the most well-formulated is the idea of decoherence. Now, I can't really explain decoherence fully because it's quite complicated, but I will kind of explain one of its implications. And the upshot with this decoherence model is that this interpretation only solves the measurement problem if we posit that there are an infinite number of alternate universes. So essentially, when we go back and measure the electron, the universe where the electron is here splits off from the universe where the electron is here and we just happen to live in the universe where one of these happens. Therefore, every time the wave function collapses, an infinite number of universes are produced, and we just happen to live in one of them, so we only see one result. Observation doesn't collapse the wave function. We are just in the universe where the collapse happened in a certain way. And like I said, this is actually possible. But it posits the existence of an infinite number of universes that we can't see and never actually confirm exist. So I would argue that it takes a lot of faith to believe that. But again, still technically possible. And there are some glaring flaws in the von Neumann-Wigner interpretation. Again, that's the interpretation where consciousness collapses the wave function. The first is that if perception of reality creates reality, how could there have been a reality before perceivers? Because perceivers evolve in the universe. So how could the universe have existence before the existence of perceivers? It does seem that the universe did exist before there were things that could perceive the universe. You could argue that we retroactively create the past. Like for example, when we observe the cosmic microwave background radiation, maybe it collapses the wave function that caused the Big Bang. But again, it's actually hard to parse that explanation with the apparent linearity of time. Time seems to move in one direction, so it seems hard to be able to um, un understand how we could influence the past like that. Another problem is the fact that if my perceptions create the universe, how can the perceptions of other people be consistent with my universe? It seems very solipsistic to suggest that the universe is created by mind, because then how is it possible for us to all share the same universe? Shouldn't my universe be composed of the wave function I've collapsed and yours be composed of the wave function you collapsed? And yet we seem to all observe the same universe. It sort of suggests that things only exist when we look at them. So the moon only exists when we observe it, which seems at odds with how we normally imagine the universe functioning. Now I'm going to play a clip from PBS Space Time, which explains this paradox, and it suggests why the von Wigner von Neumann interpretation is wrong. In fact, we can use Wigner's friend to put to rest the worst misinterpretations of the Copenhagen interpretation. This time, you stand next to your friend and you perform the double slit experiment together. A single electron reaches the detector screen and you both learn its location at the same time. You talk to each other and you agree you observe the same result. The wave function collapses in the same way for both of you. So what, maybe one observer is forcing their preferred wave function collapse on everyone else? Or maybe you are the only observer and you're inventing your friend and well, the rest of reality and there are no other observers in the universe to give conflicting results. No, the only coherent explanation for the consistency of experimental results between different observers seems to be that the result of the experiment and reality exists independently of individual observers. Sure, you could talk about a global consciousness collapsing a universal wave function, but that's not going to give you any powers of quantum wishing. Now notice something there. Matt, who's really smart and a really great educator, explains all of this really well and argues why the interpretation that consciousness collapses the wave function must be wrong. But then he suggests a condition where it could be true. If there was a global consciousness collapsing a global wave function, now we can bring idealism back into the picture. Idealism pictures the universe as being experiential at its fundamental level. It is an experiencing being. So what if the mind of the universe is capable of collapsing its own wave function? This would immediately explain how the universe could have existed before there were sentient observers, and why we all live in the same universe. Because the universal mind is producing the universe we see before us. Not our individual minds, although our individual minds may be playing a role in shaping said universe. So if there is a global consciousness, it solves the measurement problem, and it also explains wave function collapse. 
without needing to invent an infinite number of universes that we can never experience and never prove. So idealism is more parsimonious, and it actually requires fewer leaps of faith, weirdly enough. So you can think about it like this. The universe comes into being and is solely experience. But being solely experience, it attempts to perceive itself and understand what it is. By doing so, it simultaneously creates itself. The universe attempting to perceive itself causes it to create itself. How does it do this? Well, remember that I said that the laws of physics might be akin to like the archetypes of universal mind. So for example, it may try to measure itself using electromagnetism. And electromagnetism, which is one of the four fundamental forces in nature, causes the blurry quantum state to collapse into a world with definite properties. And from this world, things like planets and stars begin to form. All of this information is being held in the universal mind. John Archibald Wheeler imagined this as being like a game of 20 questions, where the universe attempts to interrogate itself. Is there a particle here? No. Is there a particle here? Yes. And by trying to gain information about itself, it ends up creating the universe as it appears to us. Because measurements give the universe definite properties. It goes from this blurry quantum state into having definite properties. So it's like this being that just comes into existence and gets really confused. So it tries to look at itself and understand what it is. But by looking at itself, it's simultaneously gaining and creating the information about itself. It's like, huh, what am I? And when it seeks an answer to that question, the universe itself begins to take shape and have definite properties. So does the moon exist when we aren't looking at it? Well, yes, insofar as the universal mind perceives the moon, the moon exists, but it doesn't exist independently of observers. It just happens to be that the universe is one of these observers. So what do you think? Does that make sense? Is that clear? I've made videos about physics in the past, and I find that people have a hard time understanding them, which is understandable because it is very, um, it is a very different universe from how we normally experience the world. But I'm confident that most of you should be able to make sense of everything I said and also understand why idealism is consistent with the Copenhagen interpretation and why we might have reason to favor the Copenhagen interpretation over the many worlds interpretation. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Discord server. I'll try to answer them. There are some videos in the description that I think you should watch if you want more clarification on all of this. Again, it's a very deep and fascinating topic and very hard to understand, but hopefully um, I've made it somewhat intelligible to some of you. But anyways, thanks for watching. Have a good day and may good luck always come your way.